questions? Uh, my name's Colin Long. I uh, used to work at the Cultural Heritage Centre for Asia and the Pacific at Deakin University, but I'm currently Victorian Secretary of the National Tertiary Education Union. Uh, today we um, have a great panel of four speakers, but first of all, if I could uh, introduce you to Councillor Jackie Watts. Now, Councillor Watts has been a resident of the inner suburbs of Melbourne for over 35 years, and she's lived in Carlton for the past 12 years. Uh, and Councillor Watts is on record as desiring to balance the tension between commerce and development, demonstrating respect for people, built heritage, and the natural environment. So please uh, make Councillor Watts welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to our guest panelists and ladies and gentlemen and the brave souls who are here tonight on a nasty cold uh, Friday night. Now we're here tonight to listen and reflect upon heritage and development innovation. Tricky. Now this inevitably involves thinking about essentially, I would say, political issues, including population density and economic growth. It's no secret to anybody here tonight that Melbourne is in a phase of extraordinary growth. Just last month, our municipality, I am advised, the 37.6 square kilometres in our local government area, we managed to tick over the 100,000 resident mark. That's a lot of folks. Now on top of that, we have to factor in our rising business population. The current figure for that is around 400,000 people. That means about 800,000 people a day filter through our city, residents, workers and visitors. And we anticipate that this figure will climb to a million within the coming decade. And that's a worry, but nothing we can't handle, we hope. So in order to accommodate this growth, responsible development has to occur, inevitably. And I emphasise the phrase responsible development. It's crucial that we make sure the responsible is in there. Now, the great architectural legacy we enjoy in Melbourne is clearly evident around us. We're sitting in it, aren't we? And retaining the architectural integrity of our heritage buildings has been, to a lesser or greater extent, recognised by the powers that be in our state and in our city. But clearly, heritage is much more than about bricks and mortar and the odd bit of cast iron lace. Our non-material heritage is of equal importance in my view. So we must consider our cultural legacies, the spaces, the customs and the memories which are meaningful to groups across our very diverse community, including, obviously and centrally, our Indigenous ancestors, the Kulin Nation. Now, no doubt aspects of all forms of, our, of sustaining and managing our heritage will emerge during tonight's conversation. So, without further delay, it's my pleasure to hand the microphone back to our moderator, Colin Young. And I'm sure, like you, we're in for a very interesting while together tonight. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watts. Right, now I need to make a few introductory comments and I just wanted to sort of set the context for our topic, which is heritage and development innovation. And I think uh, the, the political and economic context in which um, the encounter between heritage and development takes place is very important. So I just wanted to identify quickly what I think are the several main characteristics of that political and economic context. First of all, I think the transition to a post-industrial services economy, which Melbourne has undergone in the last 30 or more years, has meant that real estate development has become a much more important sector of the economy. Uh, important to notice, and rather frightening in some ways. In Sydney and Melbourne, more office space was, con was constructed in the 1980s than in the whole previous century. Urban space is, in fact, one of the most important important factors of production in contemporary capitalist economies. It is not simply a container in which economic activity takes place. Its manipulation and transformation represent an economic process in itself. 
Related to that is a, a changing economy means changing land uses, dispersal and concentration of di different activities, dispersal of manufacturing, for instance, in Melbourne, and concentration of the arts industries, for instance, obsolescence of some spatial and urban forms, and the development of completely new ones. Do obsolete forms, we might ask ourselves, become heritage or an obstacle to pro progress? We might add to this uh, economic these economic factors, the growing likelihood, I think, of economic crisis, uh, certainly in the eastern states of Australia, and the increasing number of job losses throughout the state, I think, of the canary in the coal mine there about the growing likelihood of economic crisis and what that might mean for the development of the city. Thirdly, in the, in the political sphere, there has been an emphasis on deregulation, including in urban planning, often taking the form of so-called performance controls rather than explicit limits and standards, uh, such as height limits. Uh, in the social sphere, there is an increasing atomization and reduced emphasis on collective activity and shared experiences. And this has manifested itself in many ways, one of which is an increased emphasis on private rather than public space. There has been an increased role for tourism and leisure in urban and economic planning, potentially with significant benefits for heritage, which can be mobilised as a resource and which can be used in place marketing. Sixth, sustainability, including the need to deal with climate change. There is a pressing need to make our city, Melbourne, more sustainable. Melbourne is not well placed to cope with a carbon resource constrained world, metropolitan Melbourne I say, not necessarily inner Melbourne. It is highly car reliant with a very inefficient urban form and poor public transport. Its housing stock, including new constructions, is generally of low quality in relation to environmental performance. How does the historic urban environment fit into the push for sustainability? Conserve it or replace it? Consolidate our suburbs or continue to sprawl? Learn lessons from the historic environment or start afresh? Population growth, as Councillor Watts mentioned. This puts serious pressure on the existing fabric of the city, not only in the inner city, but also in suburban activity centres, the middle suburbs, and even regional towns. Can Melbourne really cope with five million or more people? Finally, changing demographics. Increasing cultural diversity challenges accepted conceptions of Australia's heritage. How does the heritage system incorporate and understand multicultural heritage and identities? How can Melbourne's Indigenous heritage be better recognised and understood in a system with a heavy emphasis on buildings and monuments still? So that then is very briefly the complex context in which heritage professionals must do their work. And I look forward to hearing now the suggestions our panel members might have about the innovative ways that we might manage the difficult relationship between heritage and development in our city, Melbourne. It's an exciting topic and I think vital for the future of our city. So if I can uh, first of all uh, inter introduce uh, Bill Logan, Professor Bill Logan. Uh, Bill has been engaged in the heritage business for an awful long time. He is currently, sorry Bill, I didn't want to make you sound old, <laughs> but he has been. Uh, he's Alfred Deacon Professor and UNESCO Chair in Heritage and Urbanism at Deakin University, where he was Director of the Cultural Heritage Centre for Asia and the Pacific from 2001 until 2009. He was pre President of Australia ICOMOS in 1999 to 2002, International Council on Monuments and Sites, and is currently a member of the Heritage Council of Victoria and a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. So, Bill. Thank you, Colin, and good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to, to be here to talk briefly to you. Uh, yes, I have been around a long time. Um, I've been um, really working in, in this field since the uh, late 1960s. And uh, I've been involved in the international heritage scene for nearly 30 years. And I want to talk a little bit about the international heritage scene and the way that it um, impacts upon us. Um, often in Australia we 
tend to forget that we're part of a, a bigger global system, an intellectual system, you know, a discourse that, uh, that um, where people are dealing with the same sorts of issues around the world and we, you know, we forget that we can actually learn from other people and try to reinvent wheels ourselves. So in the short time I've got, I just want to refer to a few of the things that have been happening that are of relevance. Now, of course, um, the question of relevance is it's a two-way street because, of course, we have influenced the global system uh, as well as the global system influences us. The Borough Charter, which is our document, our set of guidelines for professional practice, uh, talks about um, in the important step of uh, establishing a statement of significance when you're dealing with buildings or places. And that idea has, has been accepted now into the, the global system, into the World Heritage System. Only in the last 10 years, I, I, I would have to tell you, but the statement of outstanding universal value is really something that's come out of the Borough Charter. We've also been involved in um, trying to identify social values and associative values, because of course in Australia, we, we have an enormous indigenous heritage that. Um, needs to be um, respected and, and uh, protected. Now that idea of um, associative value has been picked up in the cultural landscape notion that the World Heritage System introduced in 1993. And um, the way we try to identify values always um, has gradually influence systems around the world. I remember going to Britain, for instance, back in the 1960s for um, a workshop where the Brits were explaining how they went about listing buildings, you know, with their various uh, categories, one, two, and two star, and, you know, a real topsy kind of system. And it was quite clear that this, these decisions were just made by uh, generally old men um, like me, but who went round the countryside saying they liked this or they didn't like that and putting things on lists. There, there really wasn't a system of articulating the values. So that's come across. On the other side, um, you know, we've clearly been influenced by the global system. Uh, you know, you, you, you're familiar with the Australian Constitution, 1901. I mean, in that the, the states retained all powers except for a, a list of specific things. Now, nobody talked about town planning or heritage in 1901, so those things are not on the list and therefore are not um, things that the Commonwealth should be involved in under the, constitutionally. But um, with the, the, the controversy over the Tasmanian wilderness, uh, um, Australia was, the Australian government was able to intervene because it was a question of world heritage listing and Australia was the, 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 the level of government that signed us, that ratified the World Heritage Convention and that gave them the entry into the heritage business which they've uh, gone on and of course in the last 10 years we've now got a national list but it's very late and amazing to a lot of people that the, uh, the list should be so late. There are all sorts of other ideas that flow across from the international discourse to the local level, the Australian level. But I hasten to say that it's up to the state's parties always, you know, the countries that have ratified the World Heritage Convention to act on these. You know, it's not UNESCO that's going to act, it's the state parties. What we're seeing with the World Heritage List is, um, you know, it's, it's uh, now nearly a thousand in size and some people are saying it probably should stop growing, but um, there are enormous number of sites that have problems um, and state of conservation reports are done and some are on the, the uh, list of heritage in danger and so on. The particularly difficult ones are the living sites where there are people living within a place, whether this is a monument or a wider area. And now, of course, we have historic um, town centres and whole towns on, on the list. Now, Australia faces many of the same problems as these living cities. You know, we, we're all facing you know, rapid population growth. We have neoliberal governments that are worried about economic growth. Um, 
If you were back in the 60s, you might have said we're you know, coming to the end of capitalism, except these problems apply equally in the socialist states around the world. There is a tendency to see the number of cranes on the skyline erecting high-rise towers as uh, healthy signs of, of growth and progress. Environmental concerns are generally relegated, including heritage, in the, in the bid to keep development going. The change in character of the development industry was noted the other night in a very good and excellent uh, address by Renata Howe to uh, the Deakin Centre. She pointed out that only the Grollo company is um, a local development company. All the others are interstate or overseas and therefore have not the same feeling for the local area as, um, as perhaps the, the, the native, the Melbourne-based development companies might be. And economic returns to shareholders, you know, are the primary consideration mostly rather than um, you know, the place that is being affected by the development. Now, one of the things that has emerged um, because of this set of problems around the world is um, a new policy uh, in the world that the World Heritage Committee has adopted called the Historic Urban Landscape, or the HUL. It's a response really to the problems that these World Heritage cities are facing, you know, Cologne, where there are and buildings blocking the skyline around the cathedral, or Avila in Spain, where there's a, a very big modern building um, right in the middle of the main square that is at the centre of the World Heritage Site. The key idea in the, in the historic urban landscape policy is that we can have heritage and development, that we, we should avoid the kind of standoff that we've had between these two things as if they were always in opposition. And there is an emphasis on geographical location, trying to say, well, let's put the development in places that are not so sensitive so that we protect the sensitive bits of our cities, the bits that are the identity of the city and uh, depend upon. There is also an emphasis on good design as one way of trying to solve, you know, to develop things that are clearly contemporary but respectful of the context. So, um, you can look at the, uh, some of the examples around the world of the HUL. I mean, Paris is often touted as a, as a place that has managed to uh, con control the centre, the historic centre, and displace the modern developments to the less sensitive areas. This is the Asian center and uh, century, and of course it's the Asian cities that are growing most rapidly. I've worked a lot in Hanoi and Vietnam, which is about the same size as Melbourne, but growing very rapidly. And there again, you know, there is an, a good, strong attempt to keep the centre uh, intact, certainly with the, keep the level of uh, the height of buildings down, and to just put those, the, the new developments out in the next band of, of, of suburbs. And some of these ideas, you know, you could start to think of in terms of what you do in Melbourne. Now, the, the, the last thing I want to just briefly mention is um, another area that has developed very strongly in UNESCO in, in the last 20 years, and that is to look at um, intangible heritage. In other words, you know, these are the tangible things, the buildings and monuments and places, but there are a whole set of things, and to most people, probably more important heritage elements, things um, uh, like um, skills of different kinds, you know, whether these are artistic skills in music or dance or literature or building skills or uh, traditional knowledge systems, you know, all of, the, all of these things. People relate very strongly to these, often more than they do to the physical environment. Um, it was, of course, always possible to bring in intangible values into the world heritage system dealing with places. You could do it under criterion six. Um, there are 10 criteria and number six allows you to do that. And uh, you know, it's particularly important if you're talking about cultural landscapes. Um, in 1994, there was a, a very important conference in Nara in Japan, the old capital of Japan. Um, where there was a discussion of what authenticity means. You know, we in Australia have been hung up on the notion that authenticity lies in the fabric of places, in the tangible fabric. 
Their view was that heritage, uh, I mean, the view that came out of Nara and really pushed by the Japanese and some of the other Asian countries was um, that the significance of, of places lies very often in the intangible values that we associate with it and we have to deal with it. And the, the view came out that um, authenticity really lies in keeping the skills that are involved in in, in uh, maintaining these buildings or the rituals that go with the buildings, the meanings, all of these things are to be kept alive. And the authenticity lies in having the evidence to know that you're not guessing about what these uh, traditional values are. Now, um, that, uh, of course, is uh, enormously relevant to what we're doing in, in Australia and in Melbourne. It's difficult here because we're locked into a system that is tied to the environment and tied to planning. I mean, we, the Heritage Council of Victoria comes under the Minister of Planning, who's not going to be uh, normally all that interested in the intangible things. That comes in you know, the cultural area. This is really a different way of thinking about placemaking and about how you might deal with the protection of heritage in, in a city like this. It's not only the places in a physical sense, but it's also all of these other values. Uh, sometimes this can be very difficult. You know, you're talking about performative values quite often, and you're talking about values that are embodied in people. I mean, these are skills that people have. So you very quickly get into a whole human rights area. You know, you can't simply freeze people and you know, protect people in the way you might the physical fabric of a building. It's, it's dif different, difficult, but as I said before, for many people in the community, probably most of the people in the community, it's the intangible that is most important. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, if I can now welcome uh, Tony Birch to the lectern. Tony's a lecturer in the English department at the University of Melbourne. He used to teach history at Melbourne Uni and his PhD was on urban history, but today Tony is probably better known for his published short fiction, poetry and creative non-fiction. And he's also worked as a writer and curator in collaboration with uh, photographers, filmmakers and artists. His most recent book, Blood, is very worth very worth reading. Thanks, Tony. Um, firstly, I, I do want to say um, I'm sorry that I have to leave at 7 p.m. and I normally wouldn't do this, but um, what I do want to say that I've been I've been writing um, about the recognition of Indigenous heritage in Victoria specifically for about 20 years now. And I'm probably more confused or less certain about how heritage can operate in a, a truly um, pluralist way or in a way that gives proper recognition to Indigenous people than I was when I first be, began writing. Um, my, my sense is that, um, to put it um, fairly simply, I think that the recognition of Koori Indigenous heritage is most possible and most likely, firstly, if it's safe, if it's not confronting in any way, or if the heritage or past that, that's being recognised is, a, in a sense, something of an essentialist nature, a pre-colonial um, heritage which ignores the problematics of, of occupation, um, the destruction of land, the destruction of people, etc. Um, the image that I've got up is, is wonderful for me to just briefly talk about because this came out of a protest against the Commonwealth Games here in Melbourne in 2006 in a protest that was set up under the guise of a, 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 a camp sovereignty. It was called the protest in the King's Do Domain in 2006. Um, why I think it's such an um, educative um, experience and such an educative protest is that while the protest was originally going to last for, I think, um, two weeks of the Commonwealth Games, it actually became something that took on a much more sustained and, and vital life after the Commonwealth Games had closed and became, in the sense, of a very strong debate around whose place is this, whose history do we privilege, 
whose history do we ignore, and what is the place of a um, protest I saw, as it was called, in something called the King's Domain, which recognises clearly a very strong empirical history of conquest. And I think this is, for me, one of the central problems that we have to deal with when we're thinking about recognition of other cultures, when we're thinking about the recognition of a pre-existent Indigenous culture, is what threat that may um, bring to the stability of a foundational history, which in itself gives very little recognition either to the histories that preceded it or the histories of conflict that brought about what we might call these sort of um, wonderful Victorian cities of which Melbourne is one. So one of the things that we discovered is that, in fact, this is um, King George, he may be the fourth or fifth, I, I can't remember now, it's why I left the history department. Um, this is a King George who um, looks over um, the populace in the King's Domain. And if you go down to the King's Domain, one of the things you discover, there are endless, endless numbers of monuments to heroes, mostly, mostly male heroes, and monuments which, which really focus on those sort of um, imperial heroes or, or, or the war effort. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a very specific way in the moment. One of the things be that became, I think, a wonderful outcome of the camp sovereignty protest was, in fact, a discussion about was this Indigenous site, was this attempt to recognise an Indigenous past um, sacrilegious in the sense um, to the monuments in the park, which, in fact, focused on um, the First World War, Second World War, et cetera. So looking at the Shrine of Remembrance and the Eternal Flame. And what came out of that debate, which was in fact one of the healthier aspects of, of this sort of conflict, was the very strong recognition of um, Koori Aboriginal involvement in um, both world wars in Australia, and a recognition in fact by members of um, ex-service personnel who wanted to make a statement that in fact Aboriginal people, some of their direct descendants who'd been involved in this protest, their forebearers had in fact been men and women who had actually volunteered to fight for Australia in both the First and Second World War, and particularly in the case of men who had actually died in France defending the empire. And I think it was a wonderful outcome of this that on the morning of um, Anzac Day in 2006, while there was a lot of hysteria in the newspapers about what may happen on that morning when members of the RSL or ex-service personnel saw this camp sovereignty protest, there was a suggestion in one of the Melbourne Daily newspapers that they may march on the camp and destroy the camp or have, have a confrontation with the protesters. What in fact happened was quite different, that a very large group of um, Vietnam veterans marched to the Camp Sovereignty site. They linked arms with the Aboriginal protesters in a circle around the fire, and they shared a minute of silence for Aboriginal war dead. And it was a very poignant, telling moment where something that which was about, in a sense, the inability to recognise a shared or pluralist history. There was that wonderful moment of that protest where all of that came together, if um, too briefly. So that's one of the positives that, that, that came out of it. Essentially, though, that what I would say in the, in the 20 years that I've been dealing with these issues is that what happens invariably when people make arguments for over the retention of Aboriginal heritage or to ensure that stories, narratives of Aboriginal people are, are given, not necessarily even privilege, but given an equal hearing in the larger narratives. Again, the point being is that they are given voice, Aboriginal people are given the right to speak and to be heard as long as those stories that are told are not problematic that they do not conflict with and in any way do not contest those larger narratives. And I think when you think about the city as a monument, and here where we're thinking about, as I previously did, historical monuments or what we see as the aesthetic and the power of a city through architecture, it is very difficult for people to accept the genuine and full recognition of Aboriginal sites. Now, I want to end with this. Um, you remember the first photograph which showed Mayor John So um, himself um, giving recognition to the camp sovereignty protest. John So, as mayor of the city of Melbourne, made a promise to the Aboriginal protesters that the um, flame would be able to stay on site in some context. And that didn't occur because of um, things we won't go into here. 
Um, on the morning that the protesters were evicted from Camp Sovereignty and evicted fairly forcefully, um, City of Melbourne Council workers were immediately brought in to put the fire out, but not only to put the fire out, to remove any sense that this um, protest had ever existed. And a day later, this was the same site where the um, earth around the fire had been dug out and replaced with this um, new turf. And if you go down there now, of course, you won't find this. Now, in some ways, you would say, well, this is a desecration or a refusal to recognise something that occurred there, something that is quite profound in the sense of Aboriginal protest history in Victoria. But in some ways, I think this is a very suitable monument because what this momentary, momentary monument did, it highlighted the inability of recognition and the absolute need to eradicate and erase an Indigenous presence as soon as possible so that the eyesore would go away and the conflicting and contested questions that were raised by that um, protest and conflict would not have to be addressed. And to me, essentially, that's what I'd like to leave people with, is that when we're thinking of heritage, when we're thinking of recognition of Indigenous heritage across Australia, it, is, it should be understood that it needs to be, in some ways, abrasive. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. As I said, I feel a little rude for having to leave at seven. And I'm not leaving. I'm going to sit in the body of the theatre now so that I don't disrupt anyone who may be talking after me. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, if I can welcome now to the lectern Helen Lardner. And Helen is an architect and the director of Helen Lardner Conservation and Design, a practice which specialises in complex heritage places requiring a multidisciplinary team approach, places such as industrial sites, institutions and major infrastructure, some of the more problematic and difficult forms of heritage. She's a strong advocate for good heritage solutions and as so is often required to give strategic input on large scale developments. She's also among the most experienced her heritage advisors to local government in Australia. So thanks very much, Helen. Thanks very much. And it's very nice to be here with everybody. And uh, I've enjoyed uh, the speakers so far. I think it's interesting we're all raising um, the complexity of issues with heritage in the city. And that's also what I wanted to uh, dwell on a, a bit more. We've had a number of decades now where we've been identifying and protecting heritage. We've got heritage places, heritage buildings. We've got parks, trees, objects, streetscapes and precincts. And generally, these places are recognised on lists. The Victorian Heritage Register has places and objects of state significance. The Melbourne City Council Heritage Overlay has locally significant items. And we have the Significant Tree Register, the Heritage Inventory and the Aboriginal Heritage Register, for example. Forgive me for telling you things that probably most of you already know. But there are a number of bodies who identify heritage and whose job it is to protect and manage change. <clears throat> Their work is based <clears throat> excuse me, on rigorous historical and physical examination and comparative analysis. As Bill mentioned earlier, um, the assessment of values and against criteria are very important. And these bodies generally are kept within their jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Um, the statutory system, in a way, keeps us all in our little boxes, I feel. And so, uh, for example, here in the city of Melbourne, we don't tell the Sydney City Council how to manage its heritage, even though it might be in our interest to promote ourselves by contrast with Sydney. We could say to them, you be flashy and superficial. We'll be cultural, we'll wear black. We can be different from you. We don't say to the city of Greater Geelong, you might think your boulevards are really nice for picnics by the bay, but they're not that special to me. I associate them with long trips home after the saints have lost at Cardinia Park. We don't tell people 
about the way we see their heritage and the way heritage is on their lists. Now, of course, I'm being a bit facetious about this, and you'd be pleased to know I do support those lists. In fact, it's quite handy that I do because I'm actually chair of registrations at the Victorian Heritage Council, so it would be a bit of a problem if I didn't. And I don't think we need to tell other people how to do their jobs. But I can't help thinking after 20 years in heritage that we may be reaching a stage where we need a more mature approach. We have our lists really by type, by location, by level of significance, but maybe this is becoming a bit outdated and oversimplified because that's not how we experience our city. We don't walk down the street, even people like me, heritage architects, don't walk down the street and look from listed facade to listed facade. We can't have that experience of place. Our experience is layered by history, our history and the history of the place. By change, I think people often comment on what's different from last time they came in or what's different from when they came as a child or when they brought people from overseas into the city. These are the sort of things that view the way we, that colour our view of the city. And our view lines as such, not coloured just by history and change, but literally by what we can see down the street, by our paths and by uh, our experience of getting to places, also informs very much our experience of the heritage of the city. Sometimes I think it's the contrast that can be most important to us. Um, for example, I was in East Melbourne recently down a dark and dingy back lane, and I thought how great it was actually not to be near all those Victorian flashy facades with the terraces to the street front. I felt like I'd found a hidden corner. So our experiences, which might be about journey and arrival, can really colour our experience of place. Uh, I think many parents would um, understand that experience of walking and walking, trudging through the city just to get to the National Gallery so that the children's hands can go on the window with the water running down, a destination that's important to somebody else. So maybe it is time for us to focus more on our experiences of heritage and our values, our stories and what we love. Some of the intangible things that were mentioned by the two earlier speakers. The interconnectivity of place and our experience of it. I think we are being helped by the apps, YouTube, the blogs, all these tools that we can use now which give us a bit of dialogue and interaction with places and history where once we may have just stood there and not had access to the past. I think this is a great opportunity to elevate our experience. And we do need our heritage experts, our architects, planners, landscape architects, engineers and so on. And we need to invest time and money in protecting and managing our city's heritage. But I wonder sometimes, in focusing on that sort of heritage, are we missing what surrounds us? To have a really inspiring future, maybe we need to recognise more than the landmark places, more than the listed places. Um, I'm not saying we don't need heritage architects. I want to stay in a job. But I kind of wonder whether any architect or any planner can graduate now and not be a heritage architect or planner. Everybody's work is dependent on understanding what's gone before them and what the layers are already existing in our city. So change and growth is adding another layer and if we want to get the best results from it, we need a holistic approach. So I wanted to just end by showing some images of projects which I find inspirational. The images are provided by my colleague on the Australian Heritage Council, Howard Tanner. And uh, you've got a picture up there of Paddington Reservoir, which was quite uh, derelict and underutilised. And um, some of you may have seen the rather um, surprising and exciting project that has happened 
particularly with the integration of the remnants of the place and the ruin into some vibrant new design. I like that uh, um, complexity. Some of it is new and um, referencing what's old. Some of it is just uh, inspiring and bright and uh, captivating. The Canberra Glassworks um, is another project that I like. It was housed in the old Kingston powerhouse and you can see in that image the uh, chimney, which of course is the artist's installation of a chimney, but I like, I like that and the fact that the interior as well has a whole conversation about the sort of industrial place it was and the vibrancy of a new use and an artistic use and one that um, encourages people to the interior. Similarly, Cockatoo Island, uh, which is now the home of the Biennale, um, or one of the homes of the Biennale, and it's very much a celebration of visual arts. Um, again, I like the fact that people would come there who would never have come just to understand the convict history. But they may come for other reasons and take away a lot more of the rich history with them than they imagined. So in closing, I just wanted to say that our experience of place can only be enriched by more understanding and more interaction and for the contributions of all sorts of people to place and to documenting and to promoting and to just celebrating and having fun with heritage. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, we move next to Shelley Penn, and I think I've been given a rather abbreviated biography of you, Shelley, because I think you're much more than just the national president of the Australian Institute of Architects. I think I noticed that you're also the chair of the National Capital Authority these days as well. So that's pretty special. She, uh, Shelley's also a Melbourne-based architect who uh, mixes the fine scale of residential work with a uh, big picture of working with government as well uh, in various ways with a real emphasis on quality of design in the built environment. Uh, she provides advice to government and the private sector on design matters for numerous developments and public spaces. So very much looking forward to uh, hearing Shelley. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks, Colin. Um, I, I think I'm just in furious agreement <laughs> with my, the, the earlier speakers, and, but there's perhaps a nice sort of uh, narrowing from a very broad view, and um, it's perhaps what I'm going to say will lead on, I hope so, but I, I'm, I'm not going to be disagreeing with anything <laughs> that anyone has said. Perhaps there'll be some disagreement from out there. Um, the layers and connections that contribute to Melbourne's culture are historical, social, environmental and physical, and are all dynamic. They're expressed and embodied in many ways in its built form and landscapes. Underpinning the relatively recent non-Indigenous elements is the Indigenous landscape, a place and places of memory and meaning for Indigenous people and meaning for us. Perhaps to really illustrate Tony's point, what I'm going to talk about is the non-Indigenous intervention over, the, over that landscape. And there's a diagram here that says a little bit about central Melbourne. The Hoddle grid was laid out according to grid plan convention in 1837 by Robert Hoddle and aligned with the Yarra River, laid over the relatively flat landscape. There was debate and ultimate amendment to lot sizes, street and lane widths, and that debate was important. Those lanes and their heritage with Thrive, with living, breathing, cultural city activity now, have become defining elements. The early vision of Charles Joseph Latrobe uh, meant that before 1854, large tracts of land were set aside for the public advantage. That, that's how it was described. Royal Park, Princes Park, Albert Park Reserve, Faulkner Park, and so on. There was also much early discussion and debate about the desire for a strong urban form and for Melbourne identity. An anonymous 1850 essay entitled Melbourne as it is and as, as it ought to be 
defined a seminal vision of a model city with wide boulevards, noble axes and grand gardens. Still evident, I think. In 1885, in the boom following the gold rush, the phrase marvellous Melbourne was coined by a visiting journalist, capturing the sense of potential and aspiration for a grand place that was felt at that time. Here's the city form in this image, a 3D expression of the hodl grid, defined by the height within it, and accentuated by the river gardens and lower flanking development, all set within a relatively flat landscape. The almost featureless basalt plain has allowed space for making marks on the landscape where a more dominant featured topography might not. So that underpinning landscape has informed what has followed, even at that basic topographic level. These structural elements define the urban form and image of Melbourne, as well as how we occupy, access and experience it in many ways. It's the backdrop of individual and collective memory, meaning and cultural identity. The strong sense of civic value has been present, albeit waxing and waning, since Burke, Hoddle and La Trobe, and is clear here in the Carlton Gardens on land that La Trobe set aside, and in the Royal Exhibition Building designed by Joseph Reed and opened in 1880 for the Melbourne International Exhibition, and overlaid on that Denton Corker Marshall's Melbourne Museum, completed in 2000, a contemporary intervention in a heritage context equally grand in civic scale and ambition, and an emblem of architectural innovation for which Melbourne's well known. On the matter of intervention, there's a misconception that protection of heritage means there should be no development. Bill made this point clearly. Bill also made the point that we're, we live within an international context, and I hesitated before showing a, uh, an image from the Castel Vecchio in Verona because it's not local and we always tend to want to show local examples but that was probably my first experience of um, uh, an extraordinary intervention. I, I say contemporary but it was not new. It was done in the, I think, the 50s, started in the 1950s into a mid-14th century military fortress which on my first trip to Europe at the age of 28, was, that was serious heritage in terms of built, built form, and it was a serious uh, intervention. If you haven't been there, you must go. It's fantastic. But we do live in it. We're in, in an international context where ex exquisite um, work as well as complex approaches and, and research is done that's relevant and meaningful for us here. Um, there's another slide there which is, is a local one, which is Monaco House, which many of you will know, and I show that because I see that as an example of an intervention in a heritage context, and I'm talking about heritage in the broad sense that Helen discussed, where it's not necessarily the listed places, the places on registers, but a laneway, um, the wall of the Melbourne Club, which has a mystique and an aura to those of us who can't go in. Um, a little interesting part of Melbourne with the, the laneway there, and an intervention which is highly, of now, if, if it's a few years old, highly contemporary, but it's very respectful in its proportioning and scale. It even has a little gestural sort of triangle of, of fake grass as an as a urban space, if you like. The, the use mix is part of its response where it helps to activate that lane and enliven that space. Melbourne and the villages, precincts and places within it have identity, collectively and, and individually. And that's entangled with or embodied with urban form and space. A key to successful new development is how we recognise and respond to urban form and space. I say form and space, not character, because as Helen has said, our heritage is not just the isolated elements, not just the streetscapes, but it's in the layout the urban form, the spaces, and the details of places. Understanding heritage is an important way to understand how to respond well when we intervene. This is an image from Design for London, a book called Housing for a Compact City from 2003. And it just demonstrates that different forms and solutions can be built at the same density with very different outcomes in terms of urban form, quality of public and private space, responsiveness and relationship to context. I feel we need a range of models to allow for more responsive outcomes than, 
that can respect and enrich heritage. And here I'm talking about this question of development that was posed um, tonight to us. How do we develop in, in the context of the, of the city? I, I believe we shouldn't be, I, I believe we should be limiting um, sprawl. I, I think we should be working responsibly, responsibi responsibly within the boundaries that we have. How do we do that in a way that's sensitive, not just to places which are heritage listed, but to landscapes which are meaningful to us, built landscapes, places where we live. By carefully considering what is around it and designing accordingly, we can get outcomes that serve our needs in terms of a growing population, but respect heritage. And again, this is a particular place where in fact heritage is very strong. There's a very strong um, spatial quality which comes from a grid also laid out by HODL in the same week as Melbourne's, Melbourne's grid. A number of um, very important heritage places that the blue plaques are dotted on just about every second street corner, but it's a landscape and a precinct which is the heritage of the place in, the, in that broader sense. Um, encouraging, demanding and adopting different models and using good design in each case will achieve better outcomes with, which, res with, which respect communities. These are just random examples of well-considered um, development proposals at lower and medium height that try to respond to their context. They're not heritage particularly, or relating to heritage particularly, but to that broader, broader point that I'm making. By taking heritage elements and urban landscapes as the springboard, the inspiration for responsive high quality outcomes, we can respect and honour heritage while developing an enhancing sense of place, creating further layers of meaning that are valuable to us socially and culturally, and building heritage will, which will be valued by coming generations. And there are places for towers as well. Towers are just fine in the right place. My main point, I guess, and this is where I think it flows on from the earlier speakers, is that good design is not just about how things look, but about being fit for purpose, sustainable, durable, inclusive, all those sorts of things. It includes thinking about siting, massing, and use mix through to the architecture and landscape in detail. It's about being responsive to context, being supportive of heritage in that broad sense as well as in its detail. Good design is also not about likes and dislikes. It's not about style, and that's somewhere I think I think we 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 get caught up and and the discussion falls down. People have likes and dislikes, and they're all valid. They're absolutely um, valid points of view, and they really can't be argued with. But design quality is not about style. There's there's high quality design in in all styles. Many of the aspects of good design can be measured but many are somewhat intangible. Bill spoke about this in the broader sense of skills, practices and traditions and so on. The intangibles are incredibly important. They're essential, in fact. In architecture, I'd say beauty, delight, the experience of being moved emotionally at gut level, distinguish good design. And these relate strongly to the importance of heritage, which is about meaning. Our built environment is as much about the human spirit as it is about serving our more prosaic needs. Just to finish, I just want to say that I believe we have the intelligence and the experience to design places which protect and contribute to heritage in all of its breadth and complexity, which benefit society in diverse and far-reaching ways, which are sustainable and which enrich culture. We also have the responsibility to do so. Thank you. Perhaps just wanted to ask each of you, or together, whoever wants to, to answer. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of emphasis placed on design. There was a lot of emphasis placed on the smaller, not the grandiose, not the monuments. We sort of, I think there's an accept, acceptance in the heritage fraternity that we're beyond monuments um, to the intangible, to the smaller scale, to the day-to-day, -day and so on. Um, Michelle, presented a very strong argument for the role of design, but I wanted to ask a few questions such as uh, how do you ensure or enable good design takes place? There are good architects, but they won't always get the jobs. How do you ensure it actually takes place? Uh, 
and what is, so what is the role of the statutory realm in ensuring good design? And are there some international lessons we might learn as well that help us to ensure that good design takes place in Melbourne? Well, I'll, I'll answer, <laughs> give you a view. I'm saying I've got one, but um, I think it's, I sort of wanted to raise that too, particularly because of what Bill was saying in the sense of those intangibles. Um, and, and as Helen said, we have lists, but it, actually it's, it's something much bigger. So I think we need um, more sophisticated ways of understanding not just how to get a good design outcome, but that much, that much broader understanding of heritage, how we value intangible heritage. So I'm just saying that, but I'll come back to your question particularly, which is, um, I think we can, I, I think uh, it's not possible to measure good design. I think we can't achieve it by having checklists, by having lists that, if, you know, this is what, what you need to get. If you get all those 10 points ticked, you've got a good outcome. It, it just doesn't work that way. It's a, and it's because of what Helen was saying. It's an holistic um, combination of things that are balanced very carefully. So. The only way I think it's possible is by, um, yes, having one demanding it. So in, in terms of if you're procuring a project, you have strong criteria that say you've got to have good design. Um, but yes, having good consultants who have capability and a track record and so on, that alone isn't enough. You've got to have a client who's actually committed to achieving that and is prepared to um, pursue that and, and to support that throughout a process. And then I think you really, from the client side, how to judge whether they're getting good design. I think that really has to come from expert judgment. Um, and that's where I distinguish between style and quality. As I say, I think we all have different views on style and they're all valid and we have those, those subjective responses. That's, that's a different thing from quality, which is about that mix of, of you know, fit for purposeness, sustainability, is it well proportioned, does it relate to its context? And those can be judged by people who are expert and qualified. So design review panels is an obvious one where you have people who can make an assessment that's an informed assessment. Mm -hmm. Could I perhaps just add to that? I mean, I certainly agree with that. But I think to go back to the point that Shelley was just making at the start, um, we need a better understanding of what we've got and what the qualities and the values are that we have. And Often we're not very good at describing and putting in the public domain a whole lot of information that's out there. There's all this wonderful work that's been done, but we don't have such a good way of putting it together. So I think that we may get processes and people with good intentions who don't really have the benefit of the understanding of the development of the city and also what people might particularly value and enjoy. And um, I know talking about the city of Melbourne directly, I'm uh, quite surprised sometimes when I look up information online on um, heritage databases and things, that there's really not a lot there. And I know there's such a lot to capture and it's hard to put it in the form where people have access to it. But I'm quite heartened by these new processes of 3D mapping of how the city is changing. I was quite excited by the National Trust's um, new app with buildings that have gone. I think those things really enrich our experience and we understand a lot more about the place. So I think that we have a lot of work to do to build up our collective knowledge and to draw together all that information so that the design process, as Shelley's talking about it, can actually work on a really interesting and innovative base um, as a starting point. Um, I, I think what I was trying, alluding to really was that, and I don't want to get into the kind of panic mode that I think a lot of our politicians are in. You know, Melbourne is going to hit 5 million in 2030 and 7 million by 2050 and so on. And I think Design is part of the answer, but I'm not sure that design <laughs> no. alone can do it. There are going to be some enormous changes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should be thinking broadly about heritage, more broadly than just place. And yeah. you know, we, we want to sustain communities and, and families living in communities and so on, so that they don't feel complete future shock when all this happens, that they are keeping the intangible heritage is alive as well. And that, now that means, you know, 
uh, and, and we're kind of locked into a governance structure that's not terribly helpful, as I said before. But I think you've got to get the Ministry of the Arts more involved, and they are doing some things. Emma can talk about that um, already, but you, you know, the um, community development part of the, the, the department that Heritage is in you know, could be doing more with communities and developing oral histories and you know, recording all of this and, and uh, you know, making sure in the planning that pathways through places that people are used to and you know, these seemingly unimportant things, you know, things that often get left out by uh, the designers are really looked after carefully. Mm. I, I mean, I have to qualify, I mean, I completely agree, Bill, because mm. I, I did mm. emphasise that, but I certainly 100% agree that development or intervention is not always appropriate, absolutely not, but al and also it's not the answer alone, it's much more complex, and mm. I, I think the main point I guess I would like to, wanted to make and to completely endorse is that it's, it is about people and place and meaning, and um, I guess for me as an architect, I focus on the built bits and how, how do you intervene, how do you make something new work in that context, but it's much more complex uh, in terms of getting a really strong outcome um, than just the built fabric, so I just mm. would agree with you. Mm. Well, that might actually be a good invitation to open up to questions from the floor if we're talking about uh, hearing from the people and protecting the things <laughs> that people value. We might be a uh, good time now to... Uh, see if there's any questions from the from the floor. So several. We have one here first of all. Just the lady down here, Jeff. Just to your left. Thank you. I'm a, a municipal councillor as well, and very concerned about heritage. Um, Bill mentioned, Bill Logan mentioned the borough charter, and I really have two questions in relation to that. One regarding what are the changes being mooted to the borough charter, as I understand there have been, to update it or alter it. And secondly, apropos of elements of the borough charter which look to uh, additions to heritage places being able to be distinguishable uh, and that being interpreted uh, in, in uh, such that new additions need to be contemporary. And we've had a big conflict about that um, in our council and many of our members of our community are absolutely appalled by the contemporary buildings that are added to a Victorian terrace building. How do you uh, balance the good design with the, um, the requirements of the Bar Borough Charter so that you can protect heritage and not have a, all of North Carlton, which is going to be renovated, or Princess Hill going to be renovated and is being renovated, every um, addition ends up being more dominant than the original heritage fabric because of the, the size and nature of it. And this is one of the huge problems that we're grappling with, so I'd be interested in your comment. But first of all, Mr. Bill Logan, as to how the charter is being uh, updated or changed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Jackie, you're directing that to uh, Bill, but I might just um, jump in and say a couple of things there. Um, the borough charter in itself is really not being updated. I think you're probably referring more to the uh, guidelines to the borough charter, which were brought out to provide more information and explanation, and then over the years uh, that time meant that they uh, were outdated when the Borough Charter was updated. So um, I think, and you know, I'm sure there's other people here that could speak about that, but I don't think that the Borough Charter in itself is um, being uh, changed. But your question, and it's one that I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, where people perhaps want to blend in with the characteristics that they value in making an addition or putting a new building in and sometimes um, they're faced with that argument of, you know, it's too similar or it's too hard to read as a change. And I think for me one of the things that I reflect on most is that we are creating heritage at the moment for the future generations as well. And I think um, if we reflect on what we're doing it is quite interesting uh, because there's 
a real trend for you know, what we might call mock heritage, which reflects um, people's values and things at the, at the moment to recreate heritage. But there's also, um, at the same time, a desire to put a stamp and, I, and an identity on um, what we're doing and what our values are and what our time is like. So I think it's not an easy path to walk down to um, distinguish between the two, but I never really feel that comfortable myself if we're confusing the original heritage message as well, because I think it does, it not only doesn't contribute from our time, but it loses something from the time before. So whether you subtly distinguish the two or whether you decide that now is you know, a new era and what are we saying about our times in terms of what we're doing, um, it's a delicate balance. But I think that it's again about the stories and time passing and we can't, um, yeah, we should reflect that rather than um, confuse it. But the, the problem, I mean, I agree with that, and, and the counterpoint is that, of course, the Borough Charter that, and the clause that Helen's referring to that, that says, you know, there should be a distinction, we should be able to read the old and the new, can be used um, as a way of justifying intervention that sometimes is not appropriate, not sensitive. So you can do what Helen's uh, saying, I think, and respond with something that's of its mm, time and is, sensitive, is well done, is sensitive. Um, but you, you need a way of judging that, that sensitivity again, which I guess goes back to my point and probably why I emphasise the, the design issue so much is I think it's understandable that people are afraid of development um, because we've, we've had so much indiscriminate development. You know, we've, it's, a, it's a rational fear. We've, we've had some pretty bad things happen, including some loss of some fantastic, you know, amazing heritage places. So I, and I just don't think we do it well on the whole. There aren't that many examples of really beautiful heritage intervention. There are some, Helen showed you know, some beautiful examples, the Paddington Reservoir, Scarpa was the master. Um, we have a few here, but I think we need to be much better at it. So we do need more complex and sophisticated ways and, and local council is at the, you know, the coal face of that. Um, and I think good advice is the best answer at the moment. So I'd say design advisors as well as heritage advisors. Just briefly, I agree largely with that, although it is a problem, and I guess what you're alluding to is, you know, we, we're trying to give communities some sense of empowerment. It's their heritage. They ought to be able to say, the Borough Charter is the professional's view. You know, this is very difficult to balance out. I'm happiest, I think, when the community has found out all the, the different views, professional otherwise, and made an informed decision in that case, I would probably go with what the community wanted, but this is a difficult area. Uh, if we could just have one up the, up the back there, I think. Hi, um, I'm Margaret Mackay, Senior Urban Designer at the City of Melbourne. Um, so I give this kind of advice on a daily basis, but what I'm particularly interested in um, to ask the speakers tonight is how do cities cope with um, significant loss of heritage, either through war or natural disaster. I'm thinking particularly of Christchurch and the challenges it faces at the moment, where on the one hand it's an opportunity for uh, a, a rethink of the city and um, to rebuild, um, reflecting the values of today, but on the other hand you're dealing with um, communal loss at that, you know, of that significant heritage. I'm just wondering if you had any comments on that. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's my age, but I'm finding, I'm just, you know, hearing what you're saying very difficult. Did, can you translate that? Oh, look, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. I, I'm really not in a position um, to make any comments about Christchurch. I'm, I'm amazed at what's happened there, and I'm very interested to see how people actually deal with that and uh, what that means. However, I do think it's interesting um, from a historical point of view that some of the cities that were, for example, bombed um, in, world, in the World Wars, and I'm thinking of Dresden um, as an example, has largely made it onto the World Heritage List as a reconstruction 
of what was lost. And I think um, that, that says a lot about uh, people's values and what they want and that whole sense of, you know, um, we place a lot of emphasis on original fabric, but there's a lot more than fabric that can actually be meaningful for people. So I'll be interested to see what happens with um, Christchurch. And I think um, we need to understand that people have different traditions and celebrate um, their heritage in different ways. And I'm thinking here also of the Japanese traditions, which might lie in some cases in less in the fabric, but in the action of creating um, a building or a place. So um, sometimes it's an act of homage and it can perhaps stimulate some of the values and some of the things that you've lost. So I'm not sure that's an answer for you, but it's an interesting issue and you know, an amazing issue. Well, we might keep going or we will run out of time, but the gentleman just there. Um, Yes, I just want to make a plea for a restoration of two buildings in Melbourne. One is this building. I mean, it was butchered in the 50s when the bottom half was taken away. And even if this cinema was designed by Joe Smuck, it would still be an important building. I mean, I was a film distributor, and most of the cinemas of the world are mediocre buildings. This is one of the great ones. I mean, it just wasn't coloured lights on the ceiling. It was a control panel the colours faded in and faded out and bled into each other. It was a marvellous display. The other was, is the 1956 Olympic swimming pool. I'm still amazed that we allowed it to be destroyed as a swimming pool. It's a marvellous swimming pool. The other third quick point is, I uh, urge good manners on architects. Uh, I don't mind good modern buildings juxtaposed by 19th century buildings, but I do really uh, despise the RMIT architects who've cancerously spread their architectural statements over inoffensive 19th century and 20th century buildings. I don't think they would like it in 20 years' time if an architect came along and made an architectural <laughs> alteration on their buildings. Thank you. You probably should talk to our, well. <laughs> you probably should chat to RMIT Council mm -hmm. about that and their um, campus development committee, which I, I believe um, has a quite a strong policy about wanting to uh, procure and express innovative architects. So, so there's a, a briefing point there as well as a response from the architects. Not to defend architects, of course. <laughs> well, it's a very big debate. I mean, in Berlin, it's a very big debate. I think. Yeah, Georgia, have we got something? Just in the front here, I think. I believe so. <laughs> There's um, one of the questions that I think is fundamental to the whole business of the interface or the coal face when we're looking at intervention, Just intervention is into um, or juxtaposed with new buildings into the heritage place is the fifth dot point of the guidelines for the heritage overlay which says that new buildings should be in keeping with the character and the appearance of um, adjacent buildings and the heritage place, the white heritage place. So I'd be interested to understand what you understand as a panel to be in keeping with and Shelley particularly going to this question of the quality of the design. Um, I think that the problem with relying on experts is that they have very independent and often very poorly articulated explanations as to why it is that they feel um, something is of good quality, i.e. they're not actually able to communicate that in a form that is generally acceptable, understandable. Um, I would say that the, the premise, and going to Helen's position, is that if we're intervening in a place, we need to be able to not only tell us what the place is, i.e. it's a Victorian or whatever, but describe the qualities and the experience and particularly the perception of a streetscape, for instance in which we're building and then show the relationship. But if you could perhaps elaborate on this in keeping test, which I find often lost. Yeah, um, so I'll just respond and I think, I'm sure mm -hmm. Helen will have mm -hmm. comments having dealt with those sorts of issues in, for many, many years. Um, uh, so I couldn't agree more as far as the, the need to be able to articulate the values and I think they're more than the values in the fabric. But as Bill suggested, I'm a believer in design review panels. Um, not, not every architect is, a good, is able to do design review because design review requires a whole set of skills, including 
a sensitivity to what's there and astuteness and ability to support the work of other people and not stamp your own sort of ego onto something or want to want to draw the lines yourself. Um, and I've seen that work extremely well where um, the reviewers have those skills. So I think that's a particular skill set, I guess, I, which is really just supporting your point, I think. I don't think anyone can be a design reviewer at all. I guess that's, that's my answer to that. In terms of in keeping, um, and you, you talked about streetscape, and I guess I see that as a limitation in how we describe heritage. Or it's, and it's hard because we've talked about character, which is a perfectly good word, but that's come to mean sort of almost a, a two-dimensional drawing of a streetscape now or something about setback, whereas character is much richer and more complex. And Helen and I did recently try to describe that in, in relation to the, the Williamstown project that I showed a year or so ago, where we tried to talk about the fact that we, we used heritage, but we we're also talking about urban form and character. It was a whole combination of things, the landscape, the scale of the streets, the layout of the streets, the form of the buildings, and so on. Um, so in keeping, well, I, I might even ask Helen to, because in keeping, I think, is used as a way of, of and I think sometimes um, misused, probably through misunderstanding, um, by people who have to make judgments. Um, as meaning the same as or, or mimicry. Um, and I think that's not very helpful um, as for reasons that Helen's already articulated. I don't think that helps us in our understanding of heritage, but it can be benign, I suppose. So at times it can be, um, it's accepted because it's, it appears to be benign, but in fact, I think it does a disservice at times. I don't think that everything therefore has to be an out, you know, a, a great stamp and statement of opposition. It just can be quite subtle. The, the distinction between old and new. Um, I might just add a, a, just a quick point, and I think um, one of the difficulties for me is um, in looking at the scale of what we're trying to fit in with, because sometimes if you're looking at an addition to a specific building and you're concentrating only on that, you might see an addition or a change as um, you know, swinging the overall experience too much, <coughs> excuse me, towards the um, new. But if you consider the streetscape or you consider the suburb or you consider the development pattern, you might see it from a different context. And um, just because I'd like to disagree with somebody, because I think we're all agreeing, I'm going to disagree with Bill where he says, you know, we should give the decision over to the community. And I think my issue with that is which community? You know, who is the community? Should the people be um, the community for the city of Melbourne, the ones who vote for the councillors? Sometimes I feel when I haven't been to places that I want something, some heritage building to be there so I can make a pilgrimage to it. Am I not in, in the community if I have to visit and travel to go and see something? So I think some of our issues are, you know, what is the streetscape that we're fitting in with? Who are the community that should decide? These are tricky issues. Which isn't to say that the community... I did say, I did say it was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and and I wonder whether university programs in architecture are really doing enough to mm. develop this kind of yeah. approach. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, not being an architect, I better be careful what I say, but <laughs> you, you know, I think some architecture schools are still behaving as if it's all green field stuff yeah. that they're doing. And, you know, they're trying to be imaginative and inventive and yeah. not taking context into account. Mm, that's and increasingly, a, yeah. work in Australia, as in you know, other parts of the world, is within a context, yeah. an already built context. Yeah, yeah I, could, I agree. I think we all need to work harder. Mm. Yeah. Yes, another one just there. One we last question. Getting down to close to our last question, I think. Okay, quick one. Um, I love the comparison of uh, heritage and disaster because I think the McBride Street Kindergarten encapsulates that very well as a heritage listed site, first of Victoria for bushfire theme. I think that what you, what you just said about uh, the importance of, of who identifies what's Im you know, important in very heritage, uh, in our case it had to be everybody else but the local community because if, unless we established that it was important to Victorians, it didn't matter locally. Uh, that social significance is very difficult. When you talk about the community, they're struggling because they're just ordinary people like me. I'm an ordinary person. <laughs> Metropolitan Melbourne is cockatoo. To ad identify social significance and fight for it, especially with a council-owned building where they would see no value in it, gee, it's not for the faint-hearted. 
And communities need support to identify that. I'd love to see a workshop or something like that so that I can send some of these people who I am now getting crying out, how do we save a building that's important to us? Yes, exactly, Jeff. So, sorry, we have run out of time. I would uh, like to thank the panellists today for uh, very informative and thoughtful comments. Uh, can I just mention a couple of things uh, before we go? The, uh, Helen mentioned, I think, the National Trust app for Melbourne's lost buildings. Uh, I think Paul, that was one, that's one of Paul Rose, that's one of yours, is it? So have a look for that. Uh, it's, an, it's an iPhone app or something like that. Some postcards in the foyer, that sounds very interesting. Melbourne's lost buildings. And remember, this is open house weekend, so plenty of opportunities to get out there and experience uh, Melbourne's living heritage and support it and enjoy it. So thanks again for coming tonight. Thank you to our speakers.